Okay, George, you have two jobs, one at Prudential, and talk a little bit about your other. Uh, in 2005, actually this was a lot largely driven by um, having a background in the arts and having a creative need to release, if you will. I remember uh, 2004, 2005 sitting down with my boss at the time and making a reference that I've been doing the same thing for many years in this industry and I'd really like to try something else. Um, and at that point it was comical because he said, you have a great job, it's paying good money, few people know how, how to do it, most people don't know where you're at uh, every day. Mm -hmm. That's giving you a lot of freedom. So I took that and I'm like, okay, that makes sense. But the urge did not leave me, so I decided to open up a company which gave me just so much creative freedom that typically doesn't exist in big institutions um, because of the pure scale and the potential risk. The irony is that the risk in small companies mm -hmm. is extraordinarily high compared to the risk associated within big companies. An example, my company has four employees. I lose one, that's 25% of the workforce, and trying to get another one that's gonna collaborate effectively with that group yep. is hard. Versus we lose one here, that's a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent. That's a small example, but um, it just provided a lot of freedom that I needed in order to create, develop, add value, create a business, set precedent, mm -hmm. not go through traditional bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, done a lot for me. And it's built around the arts. It's all built around the arts. So so what do you think somebody with an arts background, a musician, a visual artist, a dancer, a, you know, some kind of, somebody with some kind of arts background has can bring to a business environment, whether it's a small business or a major corporation? Um, actually, quite a lot. It's, um, I find individuals that have any type of a arts background or a creative spirit uh, of sorts they're willing to look at the world from multiple dimensions versus one that's only trained through academia or traditional you know, black and white sciences, even though they do create uh, variability in, in the black and white, even in the sciences. So when you have someone that has a strong technical capability but can match that up with the dimensions of what you learn through the arts, and I can give you examples, um, that's almost magical, and it's actually quite hard to find, and the value it brings to an organization is extraordinary. Um, I also find that folks that have arts background of source become very self-aware as individuals, um, and being self-aware helps you become a strong leader in a big organization, and small organization, quite frankly, because if you know who you are, you know exactly how to surround yourself with the people that are gonna compliment you and allow you to be effective and successful. So what is an example of somebody who brings a strong technical and a strong arts, artistic, creative background? Um, we work in financial services, okay? Uh, back in 2005, 2006, I might be getting the dates wrong. Um, after the conversation I just referenced to mm -hmm. you, we were given an opportunity to build a solution that we knew was gonna be in great need, which was we provide retirement security to participants of 401k plans, defined contribution plans. We knew that participants are starting to get older and that they're gonna need some way to protect that income, that, they've, that, that wealth that they've accumulated mm -hmm. and extend it into life mm -hmm. uh, as long as possible so they don't run out of money. Solving for the math of that problem is a breeze. Mm -hmm. There's not a single financial services company in the country that can't do that. Right. But figuring out how to create an environment that drives action at that individual consumer level requires the art side of the equation because you're taking complexity, simplifying it in order for somebody to take action. So one of the things that we did when we created the solution that provides lifetime income, we call it Income Flex, was, well, how are we gonna get people's attention? This is very different from any other investment option that they've ever seen. And we had two needs. One was, how do we diversify our risk, you know, uh, by having people participate in this type of a solution but not all at once, because if you think about what we do, we go into a corporation and we ask 1,000 people at the same time to contribute. Well, if we had that happen in this type of a solution, the risk is very concentrated at that point in time. The other thing that we recognize was, if you're an individual, how do I make it so it's not something that you're expecting at the end of the year with every other statement that you get? So believe it or not, all we did was come up with, let's do it on their birthday. That diversified the risk across the the, the calendar here, mm -hmm. and now we give the statement on your birthday to congratulate you that you're getting closer and closer to retirement, and here's what you've done for yourselves as a birthday present. And we filed a patent and received the patent uh, as the only institution that did that. So that's an example of where you take something, well, quite frankly, is math-based, 
easy to solve for. Mm -hmm. If you don't match it up with the art, it doesn't really bring the value that you want because it's a subject that most Americans don't want to talk about. Right. Do you have an arts background? Um, Self-proclaimed. <laughs> I did study art. I drew. I colored. Um, and and it and that act, I've acted, uh, but no no sad card as of yet. <laughs> do you use it? No no no. I mean, no, do you I use don't it in your business? Oh, absolutely. Uh, here's another example. I run. Um, our entire market facing organization. So they're the ones facing off with clients, uh, advisors, intermediaries, prospects. We actually bring in an organization to do training that's specifically from the theater arts. Because what we found is the ability to deliver presence, your tone, uh, your inflection, your body language, how you stand up in front of an audience, when you speak, when you don't speak, how to listen, your reactions, that's better trained from actors than professionals. So the people that come and train our sales organizations are actually professional actors to develop presence in a meeting. Because if you think about the average attention span, it's very short. And if all you're doing is sitting in a chair listening to someone speak, you're only going to get them to listen to maybe 2% of what you said, and hopefully they retain that much. But if you're able to deliver it in a way that keeps the person very engaged by changing the tone, the body language, Making key in you know uh, uh, points of differentiation at the right time, um, pulling people in during the conversation, so it stays engaging. That's very powerful, and we work really hard to do that. That's exciting. So you use actors to train your your sales force. Are, yep. are there other creative creative types you use to train your people in, in whatever in diversity and human resources and in, in critical thinking? Can you think of any other examples or any examples where um, you would want to do that that maybe you're not doing it now? If you give me enough time, I could find a, a ton of examples. I um, I don't know if I have one per se uh, that I can think of at, the, at this point specific to that. Um, you know, growing up in financial services, I would I would tell you that that dimension of the arts, I would argue, is probably lacking, um, perhaps more so than in most industries. Mm -hmm. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. So for us, I gave you an example where we use it to create presence. Right. Um, sometimes, you know, because of the regulatory environment with financial services organization, you're very limited on what, when, and how you can say anything. anything. So we compete with consumer products and consumer behaviors that are being developed and expected by the apples of the world, if you will, where it's solely focused on in intuition and experience, and that is science and art. And we're probably one of the last industries to start adapting to that. So right now, as an example, we brought in people that have very strong backgrounds in creative electronic art in order to try to, to, to change the experience around that our consumers have. Um, I'll give you an example, and it's in financial services, it's not with our organization, but I do have an account with them, uh, where I would say this is an example of somebody being creative and thinking about things a little bit differently. Uh, so traditionally, you're asked to provide a, a username and a password uh, to get an access to your account. So when you call up the 800 number, they ask you for that information. Um, and mostly, the question is, what was your dog's first name uh, when you were growing up? What's your mother's maiden name? Where were you born? Well, these questions were completely different. They were, what job would you like if it wasn't the one that you have? And mine was, I want to be a rock star. So when I call in and they ask me that question, and I say rock star, the conversation goes completely in a different direction. I'm actually happy. I'm excited. And even if I called in for a complaint, I've already calmed down radically just because they got to know me in a way that I'm not used to. And that's an example of a financial services company that's kind of getting to that edge, which for a lot of us is hard just because of the regulatory environment. So we're starting to bring people in from social media, from creative arts to figure out how do we, how do we build an experience that's a little bit non-traditional from what people are looking to have because quite frankly, financial services for most consumers is a threatening, scary place that most people don't want to talk about inside their house. Mm -hmm. um, so how can you make it more fun, more exciting, more engaging? Mm -hmm. 
So we're working on it, but it's not something that's common in the financial services industry. Hmm. But I gave you a couple of examples that yeah. hopefully bring some of that to life. Yeah, so do they use that kind of tactic just to make it fun or to learn more about you? Oh, no, 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 to change the experience. Um, I'm more engaged. So the more engaged I am, the more likelihood I'll take action. If I take action, the more likelihood I'll have a better retirement. Let, let me share, when I started in this industry, the very first thing I had to do when I woke up in the morning was go out and do enrollment meetings. So I would be on some soapbox in a factory floor uh, explaining why everybody in this building should be participating in their 401k plan. Did them in English, did them in Spanish, the question 21 years ago when I was done with all those meetings, no matter how good those meetings went, was, okay, okay, I know you explained everything, but what, what should I do? 20 years have gone by, it's still the same question. So if you think about that, you know, no change. We've been educating and spending, I would argue, billions of dollars trying to get participants to change behavior, adapt, and feel comfortable in making their decisions. There's a need to make that change and to get people more engaged. So yeah, it's not for fun as much as it is to get people's attention and recognize, don't be scared, drive an action that's gonna make you better in the you know, as an end result. Mm -hmm. So it's not fun as much as it is engagement to drive action. So it's a real business need. Oh God, yes, absolutely. Yeah. You take, taking complexity and simplifying it in a way that makes it engaging and actionable for a consumer in financial services is magic. Mm -hmm. It's hard, but it's magic. And we're still working hard at, at getting better and better at that. Yeah. Can you, who are you using for your theater arts people? Um, and where are you finding them? We have a department within uh, my group called Peak uh, that's, uh, that's run by a lady named Linda Knox. And she, Peak stands for People, Execution, Attitude, and Knowledge. And one of the curriculums is um, uh, executive presence. I think it was executive presence. I can't remember the actual title, uh, and I think the name of the group was the Aerial Group. Are um, they local or, or? I think they're in Connecticut or Massachusetts. But if they watch this and I, I got it wrong, I'm going to feel very no, guilty. No, we want to find them. <laughs> yeah, it's called the Aerial Group. A R I E L. Okay, great. And we've had them on contract for I'm guessing at least three, four years minimum. Really. Yeah, and not only not only have we used them for our own internal associates, yeah. we were having so much success internally that we decided, well, why not offer it to some of the key business partners that we work with in the business? And those are intermediaries, advisors, consultants. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And every year we get together, bring them to a centralized location, and part of the process is sharing and giving updates about what we're doing in the business, but then also giving them an opportunity to, to develop. And we put them in this course, and it's run by the Aerial Group about presence, and they have to do stuff that makes them very uncomfortable. Yeah, how do they react to this? Um, well, some some people, you know, it's 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 very vulnerable. Yeah. But the reality is, people, adults, start to learn very differently once you hit twenty one. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's a lot of science behind that. So if you don't change things around and you're not forcing yourself to get scared a little bit, you're not advancing the ball. There's no better way than to get scared by getting some actor to sit there and tell you to scream from the top of your lungs and then come up with animal names that don't exist to just kind of free up the, uh, the room. And for people that are very somewhat stoic and rigid and you know, it's, it's been this process to get them out of their skin and recognize that they too can do it and create a better impact when they're engaging their clients or their prospects, um, that's an awesome feeling. And we actually, I don't remember what this was, it was at least two years ago, a gentleman that fits this mold just to a T. Um, perfect gentleman, great success, would follow his process, wasn't sure if this class was gonna deliver the type of results. Um, it was about two weeks after this took place we get a phone call from the advisor where they implemented some of the learnings of how to deliver a meeting, how to do a presentation, how to have the presence. And he finished the presentation after two of his competitors was driving back, had a two hour drive, called us up and said, they just called me and ordered me the business on the spot. So this is someone absent that training mm -hmm. and he had nothing to lose. At the end of the day, it's like, well, I might as well try it. I yeah. got to differentiate myself. So think about it. Absent that training, he was one of three that, quite frankly, would have looked and smelled and felt like the three. Yeah. 
here, this is someone that stood out because they had more passion, more delivery, more conviction, and uh, it, it was pretty awesome. That's tremendous. I